Hello and welcome to the Peter Philly Experience and the Q&A sessions. And this evening we've got special guest Mark Butterfield. Mark and his wife Cleo have a master collection that pretty much spans every decade of the 20, 20th century. As well as collectors, their collections have been seen in exhibitions all over the world. So tonight Mark's going to hopefully talk, talk to us about his collection and a whole lot more. So how are you Mark? I'm all right, Peter. Yeah, it's great. Good to be here. And you? Really good, thanks. And um, so, so where is home, Mark, for the, for the viewers? Where, where is home? Home is in Devon. Um, I'm, I'm sitting in my conservatory out here. This, this is where. And I look out to Dartmoor, out to one of the tours on Dartmoor. That sounds splendid. And how's the weather been? The weather has been gorgeous after it started off a bit miserable, but yeah, it's pretty good now. It's a fabulous evening. Really that's, gorgeous. That, that's, um, I, I always seem to ask the, the, the weather questions at the beginning. <laughs> well, we are British after all. Exactly. <laughs> so what I was going to do, Mark, is I've, I've, I've kind of assembled a f some questions that will hopefully get, um, be able to pull out some information from you and hopefully a, a sneaky peek at some of the some of your collection as well through the, the door so without further ado question one when did your fascination with the whole um 60s thing start collecting collecting is kind of weird well Peter, okay. sort of well, particularly the clothes, because when I was quite, when I was younger, I was pretty skint. <laughs> I didn't have any money, basically. So, really, psychedelia for me was more about the music. Yeah. Um, first of all, that was primarily, and, and my 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 real interest in that particular period was was really because of the music. Yeah. Um, and it kind of it's kind of a weird thing because. I'm a bit of an old model here, but I think I'm a bit older than you. I'm a bit longer than a few more miles on the clock. So <laughs> I'll, I'll be I'll be 60 next year. Whoa, scary. Um, and uh, so my teenage years, when when I, you know, let's think, 15, 15, 16, coming up to doing O levels. We're talking 76, going into yeah. sort of pop time yeah. and. That was that was kind of sort of that time hit me quite hard because I guess you know from going sort of pop music and getting into it getting into the alternative sort of what, what, what was the word they used to use at the time contemporary I believe okay so it's kind of like rock you know your classic rock music you know um, Zeppelin yes all that kind of stuff you know. Um, and all of a sudden this punk thing happened and I was a bit like, whoa, what's this? I didn't really know what it was at first. Um, and I kind of wanted to get together in a band with some mates of mine. And I was playing keyboards at the time. And of course, I wanted to be Rick Wakeman. <laughs> Easy job. Easy job. <laughs> Maybe that's where the hairs come from. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I wanted to be Rick Wakeman. And of course, it's, you know, it's a bit difficult being someone so good. And uh, there was a guy, as I went, just finishing my O-levels and going into the sixth form, there was a guy who was kind of like the school pianist. And he, was, he really changed my life. He said to me, I'll teach you how to play piano, but it's, if you want to play that sort of thing, that's going to take you forever. And he broke down my preconceptions about what punk was about and showed me how exciting it was and made me think yeah you could you could do this yeah <laughs> and showed me how to play piano by ear banging the chords out and so and then this happened to me he he also introduced this okay yeah the uh, the, the the seminal like um alternative album isn't it Absolutely. So when I heard this, it was kind of like, 
This was even more exciting than punk. <laughs> you hear that electric viola? Scrape, scrape, you know, and all that. I mean, the, the track listing is just fabulous, but if you have to pick one, for me, it was always Venus and Furs. Yeah. yeah. Venus and Furs is just unbelievable. It was a new world for me. And to hear that noise and think, God, oh, this is really something else. Because although I was into the energy of punk and everything, because I've been interested in 60s music, I guess kind of more pop music, really. Yeah. Um, then looked um, as, as a band and realising that maybe you could play some of this stuff. You could play, you know, you could play some of the blues and things, and you could do a bit of that, you know. But this kind of changed everything for me. This copy, actually, this is really amazing. So this copy, which is, this is a proper original 60s one, was Cleo's. And she bought it at the time. She's only one of two people I know that have an original. Of course, she lost the peel off many years ago. I was going to say she, she <laughs> peeled it off. Then. Yeah. yeah, she lost the peel off many years ago. And, you know, with her, with her total care for re records, you know, the, the cover is completely and utterly buggered. <laughs> she's, she's stood many, many things, you know, on the record itself probably, whilst it was going round the, on the turntable and <laughs> completely ruined it. But apart from that, you know, it's fabulous. Just the fact that she had it was amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, so getting into things sort of playing and playing, the first song I ever learned to play was Waiting for the Man. And White Light, White Heat. Brilliant. And I just thought, right, this is what I want to do. <laughs> so anyway, me and my mates were got into making a terrific game. And Ross, who was the mate, who was the guy who was the year older than me at school, who was the pianist, he kind of really together we started to sort of explore all this stuff. So I was I, I guess that at that time the White Album was a big album for me. But yeah. We started to back a bit earlier and then Finding Revolver again and actually really hearing those other songs other than the ones that everybody knows. Yeah. To hear Tomorrow Never Knows and think, oh my God, this is amazing. And I think it's because the big thing happens is because it's studio music as well. It's about how, we, how we've created a, a whole new sound world, which was unbelievable, you know, and it is so in, in your ears, isn't it? I mean, yeah. The way they've done the stuff with the stereo, the backward guitars, the droning, and it's it, stunning, unbelievable, blew my mind. And that's really what made me think this music's really special. And Ross had a, a tape that he got from Radio One, which was John Peel and John Walters doing British Psychedelia. And that's the first time that I heard. Tomorrow's My White Bicycle. Yeah. I actually previously bought Nazareth's version when I was a child, yeah, younger, yeah. <laughs> which is the one I knew, of course. Um, I didn't know that it was, I didn't know anything about, I didn't even know that Steve, Steve Howe had been in a band previous to this. <laughs> so that was like a real big eye opener for me that all of a sudden, yeah, this is, whoa, this is really interesting. And what great records, you know, fabulous records. Um, Stuff else that was on there, things like The Smoke, um, of course The Purple Gang. I had no idea it was a shop. To me, this was just another great, you know, I had, I'm listening to the lyrics about, you know, where Granny wearing her fur coats and fur hats. I had no idea what it was about at all. It was just really fascinating to hear all this, this stuff, you know, and incense and peppermints, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know all this stuff. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> So it was very cool. It, it, it kind of, that's really what became a big focus for me, I guess, yeah. all that. And that was really the kind of music that I wanted to make. I wanted to make music like that. And partic I suppose particularly the Velvet Underground because it was, because it was art rock, really. So, so when, so we can say that back then then in your formative years, the Velvet Underground were your main influence musically. Would, would, would that have been stylistically as well? Were you into their whole, were you into their whole aesthetic? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was cool. That was cool. Although I didn't kind of dress like that because I didn't look good at it. <laughs> in fact, I didn't look very good in very much at the time. I, I, was, I, was, I was a very ungainly teenager. I, I, I just looked, looked wrong. I was, the last thing I ever was was cool. <laughs> I was very uncool. But... But I think um, everyone thinks that of themselves, but I'm sure to other people you would have been. No, 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 no. I mean, I was, I was a weirdo. I was a weirdo. I was, I was the old kid. I was the old kid. I was, I, I, I was always the person that was friends with one or two people, and that was it. I, I wasn't one of those people that was really popular. I was always the outsider, the odd, the odd kid. And I looked for the odd, partly yeah. that, and when the Velvet Underground came along. That was part of it as well. Yeah, it was it was old music for old people. So yeah, so so you felt you'd found something then, you know, something. Absolutely, and because I was interested, so when when I went the A levels, I, I was art was my big A level. I wanted to do art. Yeah, because I was interested in drawing and graphics and stuff like that. And I guess I remember I was always so pop art was big for me at that time, and Warhol was a big thing, and I. I like to walk on stuff and I like and Lichtenstein cool. And then of course the jam are doing it and Paul Weller's got the wham on his guitar, you know, the Lichtenstein, and it's all great, you know. And Weller was fabulous. All yeah. that period of, you know, going underground. But amazing, amazing. I'd actually one gig that I I missed at, at a local Portsmouth Mercado, the Mecca, was I missed the damned uh, supporting T Rex. In 1976, oh, wow. that is really a big regret in my life that I missed that one. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it was it was kind of it was amazing because punk was all that energy and the inspiration to you can do this. Yeah. So, like I say, it was the music was big for me, and then really, I suppose we kind of need to sort of fast forward, really. Okay. Right now, so we we've left 1970. Six, seventy-seven, and we go to 1996, 1997, when I meet Cleo. Yeah. And Cleo is in London. Uh, well, she's living in Bath, actually, but, but the business, her business is in London. And um, we met in a very weird way. I won't go into that because it's too, it's too long, but it's peculiar. We're peculiar, we're both peculiar people. And so there's still all that punk stuff because punk's really big in my mind as well. I've always got this. So there's pre-punk, there's pre-punk and there's post-punk, and it's like that's the dividing line. Yeah. All that stuff that I had before and all this stuff that happened afterwards, you know. And uh, so meeting Cleo, and we're talking about stuff, and she goes, "Oh yeah, I knew Sid Vicious," and that's kind of impressive. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I was kind of impressed with that. Yeah, yeah. And then we're talking about stuff and because she's older than me, you see. So Cleo's Cleo's a bit older than me. So where then she goes, Yeah, yeah, I used to go to UFO. Yeah, I saw I saw Floyd with 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 Sid Barrett at UFO. Oh really? <laughs> and <What>? I'm <laughs> Oh my <laughs> yeah. So it was it, this was kind of no, it kind of unites both things for me. Yeah. It's like, this is, this is, here's a woman who went to, you know, the very first gig that Sid played with the Banshees, where they did the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, yeah. Cleo was there. Oh, wow. Cleo was at the 101ers gigs with Joe Strummer, and Strummer said, here, you hippies, don't, don't leave, it gets better in the second half. <laughs> and she was in that congregation. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. So, Kind of what Claire was. Claire was an amazing person. She so first of all, she was a Tottenham Court Royal mod. Yeah. And uh, from all that kind of scene, like a lot of mods, I guess, started to see this 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 scene happening. Um, that was kind of different, and all that's interesting. So yeah, and then of course UFO happens, and all that. As well, so Cleo is, is a, a basically, for want of a better word, an early hippie. 
Yeah. And, uh, she was at LSE when the riots were on, you know, and all that stuff. Amazing, amazing. And so it's like, here's this woman who's been through all this stuff that's like hugely, it's hugely important to me. Then when we start talking about stuff, you know, it's like, all the, all the same art references are there. She likes the arts and crafts movement. She likes Beardsley. She likes William Morris. Yeah. <laughs> so all this stuff all of a sudden comes together. And, and I was what do you do? Well, I've got this, I've got this warehouse and I, I, I deal with vintage clothing. So I go there and it's like, oh my, <laughs> look at all these clothes. And I guess this is kind of where it starts. Yeah. And then, so I was going to show you this. This is the first, the first piece of vintage clothing from that, from Cleo's storeroom. And I asked her if I could wear it. And it was, so here we are, we're probably 1996, and we've kind of got a bit of Brit pop going on. And, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's all very cool. And so this, this, this jacket here. Very nice. Yeah. So it's, if you can see the cord here. The yeah, cord, yeah. It's, Got a very cool sort of chunky cord thing going on, which is very nice. Little little detail in, in the in the actual cord itself. Yeah, yeah. And I really and it's just it's done in co, right? So it's yeah. in terms of I don't know what you reckon, Peter. I reckon I I think for someone like Dun and Co to be doing something like this, it's probably Sixty-nine, maybe even seventy. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to age that kind of stuff. It is, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. But anyway, I used to wear it a lot, and so when we kind of were still getting to know each other, um, she said I could wear it, and I used to take it home with me. I'm so, so I'm still back in Portsmouth working yeah. for social services, actually. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> and uh, and I used to wear this to work. And people would go to me, that's why I've got that jacket, so cool. Where did you get that jacket? And I go, you know, it's, it's an old one, you know. And people didn't quite get what that was about, really. I go, it's yeah. an old one, you know. So, anyway, um, and then just looking actually back in the stockroom, I can remember the first time looking up and seeing, seeing this shirt hanging um, on the rail. Is that, and it always fits. So it is indeed well spotted, so it's a Mr. Fish. And I just loved it. I lo absolutely, she had two of them at the time. <laughs> exactly the same. So Mark, with, with regarding, you know, like, if we, if we just reverse slightly. Yeah, of course. So Cleo, you met Cleo and Cleo got this, this warehouse. So, In so, London. So she had a shop that was selling vintage clothing, is that right? Right, so well, very briefly, yeah, Cleo was, Cleo was only ever really interested in vintage clothing from okay. a very young age. So when we go back to talking about being odd people, um, Cleo used to wear her auntie's wartime clothes to school. And she used to get all her stuff from jumble sales. Her mum hated it. She thought this was absolutely dreadful that her daughter should be buying clothes from jumble sales. And, and Cleo just loved it. She said, I, I can remember seeing knitting patterns from the 40s and seeing those women, you know, with the shoulders and thinking, that's what I want to look like. She said, and, and the whole thing, old films, everything was about being, looking back to the past. And so, she started to go to Portobello and buying stuff in Portobello because she lives in London all the time. Uh, she lives in North London and would come into London and buy, start buying old clothes and so on. And as I said, then sort of like, so that's kind of at the same time, like, so she, she would buy stuff from Bieber and people like that, that this is at Abingdon Road. Yeah. But then kind of, and mixing it with old stuff as well, particularly, I'd say, Edwardian and 20s and, and even that slightly pre-20s shape. Theo really loves that sort of that kind of, you know, where it gets barrelly at the bottom. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of shape. And um, 
So coming into sort of like 60s time, she's got a stall by this time. In, she's, she's got a stall in Portobello. Well, she's at college as well. She'd go to Portobello the weekend. She'd buy stuff at Portobello. And then she'd sort of say, you know, you, so if, the more you buy, the more you look at it, the more you realise, well, actually, that's a good one. And perhaps I could afford to sell that one now and buy something else. You know, it's like, we all, as she says, we all deal in our addictions. Yeah. <laughs> and so she started buying and selling and built up and built, yeah. up, and built up and built up more and more stuff. And she says she can remember because when Granny opened in late 65 and going into 66, she said, I can remember that it was billed as being very much having a lot of vintage clothing. So she went there and she said, uh, I remember going in and it was the most intimidating shop I've ever been in in my life. <laughs> you know, they were all so, so cool and there's no way they were going to talk to you because you just looked so far beneath them, you know. They, <laughs> they, she said it was really difficult, you know, you, you, you kind of could tell that this was another world you'd stepped into. Very, very intimidating. Very intimidating. Wow. Um, but yeah, the, the, it was the vintage clothing that she was interested in. Yeah. And to see what they were doing. And um, so she, over the years, she built up this huge collection. She'd started, um, she had a shop at the end of Portobello, eventually, by the yeah. 70s. Right at the end, down by the convent end, there, there was a shop there. Okay. And um, she says she can remember definitely Ozzy Clark used to come in and buy 40 spots from that. Wow. And um, loads of people. She remembers loads of things at the time. And, just, you know, that Portobello at that time was really exciting. You know, Hawkwind was so much based there and the whole sort of scene was around. <laughs> the whole of the mountain grill, she was, the whole of the mountain grill was the big thing, you know, and everyone said, where are we? The spoon, sugar spoons were chained to the table so you can sneak them. <laughs> there was a big sort of scene, and, and the, the electric ball, uh, the cinema in, on, uh, on Portobello as well was a big place. Going and seeing old films and, you know, all that sort of thing was all part and parcel of it, and the old clothes scene. Um, and then a bit later on, she's in Antiquarius as well. And then a bit later than that, so now we're talking in getting later into the 70s. She's in a boat market with a friend of hers selling punk stuff as well. And being a hippie and all that stuff and being just up the road, and this is when she starts to get to know the pistols a bit. Well, John, uh, Sid, Sid, she knew with John. But yeah, Sid, she knew quite well. And especially up when the pistols started to take off and John Lydon went off. Paul Sid was left a bit out in the cold for a bit and he used to come around and knock on their door, <laughs> throw things at the window and go, Hippies, let me in. <laughs> uh, so yeah, she knew him for a bit. And, uh, she, and then of course when everything changed and uh, when Matlock left and he joined the band, then he went and he went off and went tragic route. Uh, but yeah, so that was kind, that's kind of, Cleo then got into sort of um, realising that the big thing that she could do was, was that most, a lot of the people that were coming to her to look at, the, look at and buy her clothes were actually working in films and television. Right. So that's when she thought, well, maybe I can just hire to them. And that was a big way forward. So yeah. that was, and I then come on the scene much, much later. Yeah. So, um, we're, we're, there was this huge, great, warehouse in Shoreditch, uh, just up the road from when Hoxton was starting to become very trendy. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing to go in and see this stuff. And, and that, I, could, I, say, I remember seeing the shirt and the label, of course, that label, Peculiar to Mr. Fish, you know, the Peculiar to Mr. Fish label was just so fabulously, you know, enticing there's something great and anybody wants to put peculiar you know there we are then. brilliant you can see that nice and nice and clear fantastic 
I love it, you know, and, and it's just nice having the address and everything and Clifford Street. And, and I, at the time, really, I didn't know very much about this at all. I, didn't, I was just attracted by this whole thing. And, and, yes. and, and I guess looking back to sort of pictures of the birds, you know, eight miles high. I mean, oh, my God, what a great record is eight miles high, you know. And it's kind of chiming with all that stuff. Yeah. And the other thing, of course, that's on the rail next door to this show in the same is this jacket and you know we, we like that like the wall we go oh my gosh oh we go that that's a bit good <laughs> that's a bit good you know and of course every other you know, special occasions i might be allowed to wear it but yeah Claire used to wear this Claire wore this to uh, she said the last time i wore it notably was um the last nico's last uk tour oh wow years. and um of course, this is dandy fashions, and um, yeah, it's fabulous, isn't it? I mean, I, I, everything about it, you know, the, the, the Regency's, oh, it's just gorgeous. Last last week, um, Mark, um, did you did you did you see the show we did last week? I did indeed, yes, with Andrew, yes. Well, very interestingly, Andrew had the same pattern jacket, but from from um, Take Six. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, the fabrics are, are really, and and that, as you say, the brocade is 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 lovely, isn't it? And I mean, the the shape that they do is kind of they're always at it, are they? <laughs> that shape is such a classic shape of the time with this lovely little stand up. You know, you, it's Hendrix. There's loads of pictures of Hendrix where we had myriad versions of it. You know, and yeah. and uh, Brian Jones, of course. You know, yeah. Going, yeah. These icons of the time, aren't they? You know, it was and, a de rigor, wasn't it? The, those kind of jackets. Absolutely, absolutely. So, it's an absolute you know, beauty. It is classic, isn't it? And it was kind of to see that in the flesh. Wow, is like that was really exciting for me. Really, really exciting because before there was, like I say, there was this because I never, because I, I didn't have the money. You see. Because I had this idea of being in a band, so when I left school, we're still in that really, you know, late 70s bad time, no jobs. I was on the dole, I was in a band going around, you know, in the back of a van. Awful, really. <laughs> not getting anywhere, not to be, But, you know, interestingly, then the music sort of, so I guess then going into the 80s, the early 80s, and picking up with sort of Teardrop Explodes, Echo and the Bunnyman, and that same sort of thing is going through there as well yeah, and yeah. that similar sort of sound really that world is always oh, always yeah. yeah and i've always i've always liked that sound i've always been attracted to it but as i said they were kind of like really it was the music but then looking at here you know because obviously you, you spend all that time i remember it was graham i think saying you know you spend all that time when you're a kid Looking at album covers and stuff and thinking, yeah, you know, they, they look pretty cool, don't they? They look pretty cool. So then actually seeing some of these pieces in the flesh was like, whoa, that's really exciting. You know, that's amazing to think that here it is, here it is in front of me, you know. So, um, so from you know, like when you showed the Mr. F the Mr. The Mr. Fish, um, like turtle roll neck shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From seeing these labels, did it spark an interest in wanting to know more about where they were from? Yeah, I guess. I mean, and it's weird because I think at the time, I think the next big thing for me there was, you see, most of Cleo's collection is, at this time, most of it was women's wear. Yeah. So, obviously, I'm... I'm I'm quite attracted to those because they are men's pieces as well, you know, and, and also kind of that whole sort of dandy aesthetic, you know, even though I wasn't really, didn't really have the guts to do it <laughs> at the time, you know, as, as a, all the money as a young man, but kind of now when I'm in my thirties, you know, when I think, yeah, yeah, that's nice, that's nice. So when, we, when we're going somewhere and it's a bit special, she might be, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll let me work. Brilliant. Providing if anyone says anything, you say it's my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, and then I think 
the interesting thing was, which is because Cleo was, Cleo was really into the 20s, the 20s yeah. and the 30s. And I think the big thing for me then was um, Ozzie Clark. I think that was, and particularly, actually, I think the thing that really attracted me was Celia's Prince. Yeah. Um, again, sort of like having that, for a time when I, I didn't know what I wanted to do at all with my life, when I was, did stuff like I say, um, I thought I was going to go to art college, and then I thought, I had this crazy idea about being in a band, so that never went anywhere. And plus the fact, I remember sort of saying to a teacher of mine, you know, so what did you do? And he went, oh, well, you know, you go to art college and then you, you know, you become a teacher. And I was a bit like, oh. And I could tell, you know, art teaching is, is kind of, well, it, well, well, in the old days, it was pretty non-existent, I always think. But, and and I, I could see his disappointment. This is what I ended up doing, you know. And I kind of thought, but it's realistic and so even though I, I didn't go to college my mates went one of my mates went to college but i was in the band and, and then i got in another band and blah blah blah, blah. And anyway it all, it all went nowhere people all went nowhere like so much of this does but um yeah but coming back to the whole thing with with cleo it's because i said because i had that art side i think that it's the graphic quality of of Celia's prints, but the way she she put some that space around them, yeah, was was amazing. I, I was I was really taken by how beautiful they were and how strong they were. So um, I think that really took me somewhere. And then of course I suppose yeah, you do start to you start to over the time, you know, you you go oh yeah, Chris, yeah, and that 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 you know that that as you say, you do start to pick up stuff. So you realise, yeah, that, that, that Hyde Park Jagger outfit, that was Mr. Fish. <laughs> you know, and, oh, yeah, 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 that, yeah that, that, and then keeps wearing, you know, blah, 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 like this, you know, you know, and you start putting it together a bit. And it's a bit higgledy-piggledy, I guess, you know, you, you sort of like start over the years putting stuff together, I think, and just chatting to people. Yeah. So wow. it was good at the time we were doing um, a big fair in Panacea. And I got to meet um, people would, would come up and start talking to me because we were quite into Ozzy, and it was start. Ozzy was on his way up at that time as well. So I guess we're talking early two thousands. Yeah, something about like that, I guess. And it started to so so because we kind of have a bit of a specialism in the back. Because we kind of I liked it, so we kind of buy it together as well. Yeah, and we were just buying and selling, and then keeping special bits. And um, I, I, people would come up and start talking to me. So I got to speak to a few old English boy models and stuff like that. And that's really cool. Then you think, oh, that's really. Good. So then you talk to them about. So what's oh, so tell, tell me about this and tell me about that. You know. And, um, yeah, so that was that was kind of nice as well, and, and, and feeding back into this sort of period of so what was going on, you know, and that whole scene, I guess, that whole scene, and and it was kind of like you say, I can't remember, I can't remember when it happened exactly, um, but um, I don't know where this came from, but so this this is this is Aussie Grant, so this is a man's Aussie Grant, because obviously so many of the of the Aussie pieces are, are for women. Yeah. Uh, but this is a man's this is a man's shirt. Um, and and this is quite rare. So this is a scarf. They often used to design the scarves to go with with pieces. And yeah. and so this is this is let me it's the old Aussie label there. Look if I'm saying there you go, let's move them out of the way. So, can you see that? Yeah, we can now, yeah, yeah. yeah reflection on there, but anyway, so it's kind of the old, this is pre, it's about six, well, Celia's probably been using this print for a little while. There's some very early ones. There's, there's some pictures of Patty Boyd wearing a very early dress. And um, one of the other models that's with her, and I think this is early 67. Yeah. Uh, there's one of the other models is wearing different colorways of this dress so she's they're kind of using some of these prints in different ways 
but it's nice to have it on on this 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 satiny shirt so it's lovely and shiny what what's the what's the fabric it, it's a satin satin yeah it's gorgeous really lovely and shiny and it's kind of got a silvery silvery quality to it yeah, it's like a monochrome looking isn't it it is yeah 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 it's it's very nice it always kind of makes me think slightly animally printed as well do you know um there's a there's a picture of brian jones in an hospital and i'm pretty sure it's the same thing that brown there is a, here we go so this is the the, the bailey which kiddo kiddo bought me for a christmas present nice <laughs> and here we go so there's brian that's the one yes and, and as you can see He's got the scarf on as well. Yeah. Which is why I put the two together. So Fantastic. And, and sadly, I think this is one of the last studio pictures of Brian with the stones. Wow. And he's, you know, Brian was, Brian looked great for so many years. But I, I remember you also saying to him on one of your TV interviews, he, when you did the radio thing, um, you did a radio interview when had um oh, a while ago now in okay. london oh well, and you yeah. had your apple yeah your apple jacket and i remember you saying to one of the guys well you know brian actually he started to look really rough towards the end yeah. and i think you can kind of tell there it's it's poor brian sad very sad but, um that's a that's a nice portfolio but, it is, yeah. It's, it's, and obviously, very. I was so. I mean, they came separately. Those yeah. two pieces. Um, the, the, the staffs are quite rare, and I, I, I got this. I got the staffs with some other early Aussie pieces. Because um, yeah. this is this is pre Radley. Yeah. So, I was always fascinated by the fact that all of these, um, a lot of these businesses are kind of. They, they, they being businessmen wasn't their forte, <laughs> and you know I always think, I was always sort of like slightly bemused that you know in say let's say sixty eight that Aussie Clark has got these huge big fashion shows with the Beatles wives you know as as models and there there's John and Yoko and 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 you know they're all in the audience there's rock stars there. You know, their clothes are being launched all over the world. There are people saying how wonderful they are. And how come they're not making any money? Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, I think huge, they didn't care the basic two people. I think their big thing was to make beautiful things. That's it. Like, like um, I've, I've um, always said that with, with people that are into the arts, whether it's music, designing, painting. They're not business people. No, they're not business people. And they didn't really care. So, you know, I think there was a... I remember someone saying, I, I said to something about why was that the case? And they'd say, oh, well, you know, someone would come round and blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, Aussie would... There's some woman there. This is great shift on dress. Aussie's just have it, have it, have it, darling. Have it, have it. <laughs> Give it away, you know. And, yeah, and it's great, you know, all those women get to see these famous people wearing them, but I don't think there was that business acumen behind it to go, no. we actually do need to make some money <laughs> in order to survive. And the, the thing is, with, with, with um, a lot of this stuff that we all, that we all appreciate and love all this stuff from that period, most of these businesses were the same. Luckily enough, we've got we've got the art now, the pieces, it, because I think if they were doing it on a strict business um, point of view, yeah. a lot of this stuff would never have been made, created. I think you're absolutely right, PJ. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and I, I've spoken. I mean, this is the most I, I, to think when I think of myself as this. You know, cast my mind back as I was doing today to put all this stuff together. And thinking of myself as this, you know, 17 year old, 16, 17 year old in Pompey, listening to these, listening to this John Peel, uh, John Walters tape and hearing that song, Granny Takes a Trip. I never, ever 
could I never was even aware, let alone dreams that I would actually talk to Nigel Maynard at some point. Yeah. And talk to him about those posters and about these clothes. And you know, that to meet these people is been amazing for me. I mean it's incredible for me. It's what, unbelievable. What, what one I was gonna mention um regarding regarding Nigel, I think that like I was aware of you obviously because of your you know, collecting, but I remember in uh, 2017, it was the 50th anniversary of 1967 and there was lots of different events going on all over the place. And there was one event that was happening at the Albert Hall that we had to yeah. go and we could meet for the world. And you were curating and with Nigel, um, John Pierce, and um, I can't remember the, 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 the lady. Jenny Spires. Jenny, Jenny Spires, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, interesting. It was great. I mean, again, it's like, here I am, this boy from Pompey, and okay, it's not the, we're not filling the Albert Hall, but, you know, <laughs> even just to be in the Algar rooms, in the Albert Hall, with, these, with, with this crew, you know, is, yeah. is, was unbelievable to me. Absolutely, you know, incredible. And um, to the viewers out there, um, it, there was Mark on stage, and there was a, there was, a, there was a, there was a girl that was kind of a presenter, Amber, wasn't it? Amber, yeah, Amber Butcher, yeah. That's right, and she's like a, she's a fashion historian. It was kind of a compare, kind of trying to keep some semblance of organisation. And there was Mark with his collection of Granny's clothing, and then you had John and Nigel and Jenny talking about you know back then. But they showed that that bit of black and white footage that I've never seen before. No, and it's really, I'm going to try, I'm, 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 I'm still in contact very, very vaguely with Jenny and Jenny would be able to track down that, that piece of footage for us. Wow, and, amazing. And weirdly, they, 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 I mean, it's totally bizarre this Peter, but a, a completely odd coincidence was that, that the guy that actually was there filming that evening had actually been to our house previously on a double <laughs> and said, I know you. I said, do you? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to your house. You live in Devon, don't you? Said, this is crazy. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. I came. And he, and he told me, so you did. I remember. I remember. And it was the thing for the bees. It was the thing for the bees he came for. Oh, the, that, 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 that fashion program yeah, where, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. wow. What a coincidence so, that he was filming. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it it was kind of like far out, really. That this, yeah. this world is like this big, really. <laughs> and that was like that was my first like physical introduction to you. And when I was just seeing, because they there were some models uh, like midway through the the tour, modelling some of Mark's collection that was related to the tour. Granny takes trip clothing. It was for me just to see it. It was fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's really cool, you know. And um, well, I guess I guess this this kind of brings us on to Granny in a big way, really. Yeah. <laughs> one, one thing Susie did say, and I regretted after this. She she says to me, "You should take some of your pieces with you to this talk." And you know, and there was I remember during during the the talk, the, so they did ask, "Did any of the audience have any?" pieces with them and there was one gentleman wasn't there stood up yeah 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 in fact this is really interesting peter that guy later actually contacted me and said would you like to buy that jacket oh, from wow. me? and the shirt and it's really cool it's very cool i can't because oh, i kind of we, 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 we'll talk about the exhibition soon but <laughs> it'll obviously it's going in the exhibition one of these exciting things that we also that this guy had um which, which I'm going to borrow for the exhibition. He had his original UFO membership card. Oh, wow. Which was signed the second, the second date. So it wasn't the December one. It was um, January. January, January, yeah. Amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, far, it's just like far out to see it, you know. This, this, this. And of course, it, it didn't even last the whole 12 months. He's got a 12 month membership card, which didn't even last that long. I mean, they, they, I think they did what, um, Six months at Tottenham Court Road, yeah, and then on to the Roundhouse, wasn't it? And even yeah. then, it still never lasted that full year. It never lasted it 
never lasted right through his membership. But uh, yeah, it, it was so cool to see it. And I said to him, you know, oh, can we use this poll? Yeah, of course you can. Just let me know. Of course you can. Well, you know, so. And of course, UFO is, is what, what could we say? What can you say? You know, it's. Yeah, I can You know, and the, the Mark Boyle light show, the whole thing, you know, the, the posters, that whole scene is, it's graphically so strong. And I guess then the music, the graphics, the clothes, to me, are all like, like this and, and so tightly bound together. And then I think there's this other stuff as well, you know, because like I was saying, it's got all those, it brings all that other thing in because I, like, when, like I said, when I was interested in art as a, as a teenager and, and Beardsley, you know, and Beardsley is yeah. hugely important to that early movement. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Anthony Little, obviously, as, yes. as a big so I've just got a few of, you know, I mean, this, this, you know, that is a fabulous image. I love it so much. <laughs> so this is from a, from a book that Anthony did in 67. And uh, I've, I've, I've been speaking with Anthony and went to visit him just before the COVID thing happened. And he's, he's really generously going to lend us some of his pictures for the exhibition and things. And, and of course, the big one for me is the, the hung on you backdrop. Yeah. It's just fabulous. Do you, know. to, um, do, you want to give, do you want to give a quick brief on who Anthony Little was to the viewers that might not know who, who he was? Graphic artist um, and a really huge um, influence on, on Anthony was Wizardry Beardsley. Um, and he was, he was drawing in this style. He, he, I did. I'll just I'll show you another one. I love this one particularly because, as as Barbara always says, the thing about Art Nouveau is it's never boring. No, it's unlikely to be boring. It's got oh. all that squirreliness, zonkiness going on, and it's always a bit saucy. Yeah, I was going to say that, which is very risque, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so first we've got the naked woman, and there's certainly something a bit going on in his trousers there. I seem to think. <laughs> you know, he's obviously <laughs> pleased to see her as my yeah. rest. <laughs> um, and he, he, I mean, just the, as, as, as another one, a very, this, this is highly Beardsley-esque, you know, of Beardsley's oh, yeah. more mental style as well. Uh, but again, you get that, that whole idea of where Anthony's coming from. Because um, one important link as well in that period, like when Hung On You first opened, like Aubrey Beardsley, I believe, had an exhibition, or was it in 66? At the UK? A1 at 66, but there'd been quite a few Art Nouveau exhibitions around, um, around the country as well. There'd been a Brighton one, and there's, there was a, I'm told by, by Barbara tells me I should say Musa. I, I grew up saying Muka, but she, yeah. kind of, she, after all, she's from that part of the world. So it's Barbara Hulaniki, who I've also got to know. I mean, this is crazy, isn't it? You know that I know these people now. <laughs> so Barbara said, Barbara said, my brother always says Musa, Musa. And, uh, and again, Barbara, of course, grew up with a, a lot of her time in, in Brighton with her auntie. And in 63, there was a, uh, a Musa exhibition. And also, I think one at the V&A as well. I think that went to the V&A. So again, that's, but what's interesting there to me is, is, is growing up through that period. To me, that became a huge influence in, more in the 70s. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, particularly the mirrors and the stuff, you see yes. these art art mirrors with the girls, you know. Yeah, we've because, got a lot of them. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, we were all the same, aren't we, Pete? We love yeah. that stuff, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's go back to Anthony. Um, like you said, early on, and I think people like Anthony and Marika uh, Koja of The Fool, were both drawing very much in this black and white style. And looking back to that Edwardian Art Nouveau, um, arts and crafts period, and the aesthetic movement, really. Yeah. And then there's that whole thing, you know, of the thing that's written above the door at Granny, as Nigel says, and it sums everything up. Oscar Wilde said, one should either be a work of art or wear a work of art. And, you know, that's, that's where we come back to the clothes again. <laughs> So it sums it up perfectly, doesn't it? 
sum it up perfectly, really. Oh, I was gonna, one of the things, again, I was going to say about these scarves, uh, this is an interesting thing. So this, this, this scarf, and interesting, it's got far more of a sort of a deco print on it that Celia is doing at this time. So this is probably 67, 68, something like that. And um, far more deco with the stripes and everything. Yeah, I was going to say, it looks very deco. Yeah, and, and quite ahead of its time in that respect. But also, you know, so this is a 30s influence. I don't know if you know about these. We always call, me, me and Theo always call them torpedo scarves. Right, so they're cut, yeah. cut on the bias. Yes. This is the, this is the, the cloth running this way here, and it, that's yeah. your edge material, and it's cut across, so it'll hang and do this, you know, this neat thing. So of course you, you, you know, you do it because you, like yours, it makes a nice thin, thin, you know, and, and it's based on a 30s one. So this is a real 30s one. And if you look at, it, you know, I don't have to tell you this, Peter, but, you know, then if you look at pictures of the time, you know, you'll see, you'll see rock stars wearing them. They tie them around their necks, they tie them around their legs, they wear them with belts, you know. Yeah. And it, it kind of became one of those things was to have, you know, the 30s, I say torpedo scarf, we call it. Yeah. And the yeah. more deco, the better, really. The, better, the more deco print, the better. That, that is a beautiful one. That's a great one, isn't it? Clear's, Clear's got a whole, Clear must have about 300 of these. Wow. <laughs> Going back to the, um, to the Anthony Little then, just to quickly finish on that, um, to the viewers, basically Anthony Little was commissioned to do the, the front window for the Hong On You, and he also did one of the interior um, walls as well. In, Absolutely. In and that Aubrey you know, Beardsley style. Beardsley style, yeah. And to me, that I mean, it's, I don't know, there's something so quintessentially fabulous about that image. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love it so much. Uh, that 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 particular one. Um, I'm hope one of the ones that I want to borrow from Anthony, so I won't spoil it. But just to give people a, is actually he did a double self portrait of him with with Aubrey Beardsley. Oh wow! And I really want you know that would be such a great image to use. And, 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 and you know here we are, crazily when we're talking about moving up to our exhibition. But the tape just before we, we're due to have. And Aubrey, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so frustrating. You know, here I am. I'm wearing the t-shirt here, <laughs> wearing the Aubrey Beardsley t-shirt. Brilliant. And uh, and then it shuts down because of COVID. You know, so and crazily they had a section. I never actually got to go, but they had a they had a section on. Um, I was told um, by someone who did go. They had a section on on sixties revival Art Nouveau. And Anthony Little wasn't mentioned, which I think is a crime shame. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of really want to sing Anthony's praises here as, as the. And then Anthony, of course, went on to, as he said to me, it was very difficult to get money out of these fashion people. And I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe interior decor has got more going for it than this fashion stuff, you know, because they just want a window or whatever. And uh, then they, they, they that, and that stays there for God knows how long. But you know, but anyway, instead of getting the money out of them was quite difficult. So uh, then he, he teamed up with his, I think it was his cousin, uh, uh, which I forgot to mention. Anyway, so he's the part of Osborne and Little, and they became the wallpaper firm. Also onto King's Road at the time, of course, then went yeah. and Ray, and then, of course, George Osborne is. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we won't go there. <laughs> and what one other famous um, design, iconic design that Anthony did was the Beaver one, wasn't it? The, the Beaver. Absolutely, and the Beaver window as well, which is fabulous. And again, so I guess we should now start talking about. So for a long time now, me and Cleo have been trying to hatch this this uh, exhibition. We've kind of had these clothes, and it's and gradually, you know, you find more and more pieces, and you people will bring stuff to you. The big thing that really happened for us was uh, we got, and again, at, at one of these fairs, I got to meet a guy who worked with Celia Burtwell, and he told us about when the Aussie Clark exhibition was going to happen, the retrospective was going to happen at the v &A. And we lent pieces to that exhibition, and we kind of went from being 
relatively unknown in on that sort of like whoa people who do stuff with the V&A <laughs> uh, that that kind of made it a bit impressive to me we played yeah. for like half of the world and um yeah i mean the V&A's got goodness written all the way through it obviously and uh yeah it was tremendously exciting to be involved with that and um stuff comes out of the woodwork then you know people would contact me and say i had this and amazing pieces would come out of the woodwork amazing stuff would be yeah. unbelievable so we and then you know people would get to know that you're interested in it and and it's kind of weird because at the same time and i, I don't know whether this is kind of my weirdness but i wasn't really aware of people like you peter what you were doing and let's go back to the albert hall one of the things one of my big regrets is is that you know there you i saw all you sitting there and i didn't go these guys look amazing. Come on, let's have them on the stage. But it wasn't really my gig, you know. No, no. I don't so think was, I would have anyway. I, I wouldn't, you know. It's, but you all look great and you should have been up there on the stage. It's, you should have done. I, it was always a regret of mine that I didn't ask you. And then I got to know you a hell of a lot earlier as well. Yeah. But it's, some, but it, it's like um, when, I had, when I did the first show with Graham, it's like um, me and Graham and Andrew have been on the same scene for 30 years, but, but you just, sometimes you, you know, that, that meeting doesn't happen till the, the, when, it's, when it's supposed to happen. Kind of weird, isn't it? And bizarrely, you know, I couldn't believe it, because you know, then you say Adam, uh, Andrew is living in Fairham, which is kind of like just outside of my hometown. Yeah. And we must have crossed paths. We must, I mean, all the places he mentioned on, you know, last week, I know all those places, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so you, ev eventually you do get to, you usually get to meet like-minded people. So, you know, yeah, and, and then, so there was this woman, and we kind of, because we Cleo, we, we knew this woman who used to say, she used to say to it, you know, oh, I, I, but we're talking about the old days, you know, and yeah, I've got these friends, you know, and they've got these clothes, and, um, but they don't really want to part with them. They don't really want to part with them. But if they do, I'll make sure they come to you first. Anyway, I can still remember the day this suitcase opened, Peter, and, and uh, my mouth fell open. <laughs> it's that kind of, and I just thought, who are these people? Who are these people to have all this stuff, you know? And so this is in the cup, this is- Oh, look. And so these two people, were Nigel and Jenny Gordon, that's my Gordon. And uh, Nigel, I have to show you this image as well because it's so beautiful. So this is Nigel in 1967 wearing a coat. And it's, I love it, I love the hair, I love the shirt, everything about it is fabulous, you know. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know anything about them at all, it's just that these were amazing people and and I so they come and I knew they they've had this stuff this is it you know they've had this stuff since then since then um Nigel told me very little about them except I kind of knew that they were they weren't just run of the mill just because of the clothes and then Jenny said to me do you know Stash and I said, do I know Stash yeah you mean stash, stash the roller? Yes, of course. No, I mean I don't of him. I don't know him. You know. Oh, he's wonderful. You know, and, and you think, all oh, right. Oh, I see. <laughs> so you know, and, and there was nothing showy about it. It was just these are the people that we we knew. And so anyway, I, I this is. I, I said I, I said to them. I can't believe, I can't begin to talk about how much these might be worth. Mm. It's beyond me at the moment to know what we, and th they were amazing, Peter. They said, take it away. Think about it, take it away. So they gave me the whole suitcase full. That's Jenny's Apple outfits, um, Nigel's, uh, Nigel's hung on you suit, this granny and 
but other pieces as well. Other pieces yeah. as well. And incredible. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. We trust. We completely trust you. And I was totally gobsmacked that these were amazing people that I'd met. These amazing people. And then we started to talk, and Nigel told me that he was they lived in Cambridge, and that he was best mates with with Sid Banner. Yeah. And they they started. Nigel was an experimental experimental filmmaker, and he started to go to London, and um, being in with the art circle was meeting with John Dunbar, who at the time was married. To Marion Paisel. Yeah. And so they were kind of part of that scene. And then that was on the edge of disintegrating their relationship. And then Marion goes off with Nick. And they got to know the Stones. <laughs> so they not only know Pink Floyd, but they know the Stones. And then I find out about 101. Columbia, yeah. Which is where they live, you know, and of course. It's also on Sid's Man Cat Last album with a with the, well, that's in that's in Cromwell Road, you know, and the whole thing. And it's like unbelievable that, that you know, what what a, oh my God, what is going on here? And, then we, and so I get to know them a little bit more, and they're talking about, you know, the when when they when the the uh, the International Poetry Festival was on, Ginsburg stayed with them. Wow, you know, <laughs> you know. All of these people, it was all kind of, they were really part of that scene. Yeah, very much, so. very much so. Very much so. at the hub of it. And it, it was kind of like an honour to know those people. <laughs> and, you know, to, like, to own garments like that in itself is amazing, but then to have concrete provenance as well, you've got the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. And I mean, it's interesting because it's kind of got, it's got a good bit of wear on it. Um, if you can see around the collar here, it's, it's got a big bit of wear here. Can you see that? Yes, yeah. And, there, and there's a bit of a hole in the back here. And if you can see that where it's... Yeah, yeah. And um, basically, Nigel parted dead hard in these clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Dead hard, you know. There, there was a lot of serious rolling around on the floor going on in his class. <laughs> and so Nigel was an English boy model, something that he never told me. Um, he knew, obviously, he knew the granny crew really early, you know. Blah, it's, he knew Michael Rainey. He knew all the way, he knew them all, basically, people, you know. And to be part of that scene, yeah, I had this stuff. So, of course, I used to have more as well, but it's kind of... And this was always very special to him. Yeah. And it's very special to me as well, <laughs> for that reason. You know, I, I love it. I, I, Cleo used to say to me, perhaps we, should, we, could, we could do something, and we could... Because we, could, we found some uh, original Sanderson's fabric, and we thought we'd actually... She said, do you think we should replace it? And I said, I, I actually don't want to do it. Because it's kind of the state that it's in, says yeah. so much about Nigel, and I really kind of like that. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's that all those little details, the fact that the calf flares out, you know, the Morris print itself, going back to the arts and crafts movement, to William Morris. So the, the, the wild statement, you know, that one should either be a work of art or wear a work of art, and that whole dressing up dandy aesthetic, you know, yeah. of, here, here I am, I'm, I'm, well, I put this stuff on and I, you know, and that idea of Christopher Gibbs saying, you know, in, in 1966, if you walked down King's Road and you saw someone in the distance that, you, that was looked fabulous, you knew them. Yeah. Because that world was so small. Yeah. But by 1967, they were probably everywhere. <laughs> and that, that kind of is interesting as well. I think that 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 the the the, the explosion of psychedelia through the fact that people like the Stones and the Beatles were part of it. 
and promoting that straight, you know, from, from being an underground kind of rock movement, really. And I, I've got a whole sort of feeling about how the clones become that transition from, especially with the Beatles, from being a pop group. Yeah. Becoming a rock band. And I think that's very clear with the Beatles, uh, how you see them dressing individually to their own tastes. That's right, yeah, yeah. And, and how they're choosing those clothes where they wear the, you know, from, from the back of Revolver, where they're, where they're wearing the granny stuff, and of course, George is wearing his hung on you jacket. It's, it's very cool, you know, they gain the Liberty print, you know, Lennon's, Lennon's shirt is a Liberty print, and again, that's Arthur Liberty, you know, and all that kind of back to the Nuvo stuff, and the, it's all, it's kind of pulling all this stuff together, and I think that was why this period chimes so especially for us both. Yes. So. It kind of pulls all that stuff together. I think they were, they were important periods for both of us, for Cleo. Yeah. Um, it changed her life, being a hippie, going to LSE and, and, and UFO and stuff like that. It, it, her whole philosophy of life changed. And it certainly, I say, changed that sort of that music and that scene changed my life. And then us meeting together, all that kind of stuff came together in this in this decade. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's like a, a perfect circle, isn't it? Almost a perfect circle. Yeah. It, 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 so this period's really special for us, you know. So here I am sitting on a, you know, a William Morris fabric sofa, you know. I, and, I, did, I did clock that very nice, yeah. Mark. This, we, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that the time's getting on. So, um, basically, um, um, Mark's got a, a, a massive, massive collection, but, but uh, Mark's got a show coming up. Well, I'll let him, I'll let him talk about it. So, what, basically, what we're going to do is, Mark, we're going to do, we're going to do a part two of this, where Mark will show more of his, more of his garments when, we, when, when it leads up to the exhibition that Mark's going to tell us about now yeah so the exhibition was due to happen in july which would have been cool because that's kind of when my birthday is but uh, due to covid19 it's kind of a bit of a tricky thing and you know museums are shut everywhere and uh we had a call from the fashion textile museum saying we're very excited about the exhibition and we feel that it would be a shame if you go on their website at the moment i think it's still up saying that it, it, it was it's probably still up there as a scheduled opening for July. Yeah. Uh, and we kind of wondered if it would be early. And then even then when it did open, how, how would it open? Because we, we kind of imagined this great, you know, opening party with everyone, you know, <laughs> all these people from the time getting together, you know. And of course, Peter, you know, I, I want to mention you as well. I mean, Peter has been fabulously generous, fabulously generous. And maybe we should explain the story at some later point, Peter, how yeah. we... We came to cross paths, but yes, it's yeah. highly relevant to the exhibition as well. And Peter's been fabulous. Peter's been fabulous, and um, and it's an amazing collection as well. Absolutely amazing, top rate stuff. Um, so the idea is was was to sort of create those those boutiques. And part of the problem, it's now seeing it as well, is we were going to create an alleyway with boutiques either side. But if you can imagine, that little alleyway down the middle is very narrow and not very suitable for social distancing to open again either. So the Fashion and Textile Museum have decided to get rid of that idea. We, so we still want to create boutiques, but they're not going to bunch it in quite the same way. Uh, but we want to create, recreate the feeling of what it was like in Glen Takes Trip and the feeling of what it was like in Hanging Week, with obviously the clothes as well, but also with Anthony Little's drawings for, for, for Hung On You and for Bieber and some of the, the bigger stuff as well, some of the backdrops. Uh, Nigel's posters that he did for Granny and of course, obviously you've got to mention UFO and all that stuff and Mr. Fish, all the stuff we've been talking about, Ozzy, looking and Dandy Fashions, all of those people, Apple, the Apple Boutique, and the idea is, is to kind of give everyone a flavour of what that whole thing was about. And then the idea is as well is that, so what's, so what's unifying this thing? And 
we always had this idea that we call it beautiful people after baby you're a rich man and john lennon said how does it feel to be one of the beautiful people and i've always said you know that that's interesting because he wrote that song after going to the dream yeah. and the day afterwards he wrote that song and i always think did someone actually say to him how does it feel to be one of the beautiful people because if there ever was one, he was certainly one there. And if you yeah. see footage of that, of, the, of that gig, you know, as, as much as it was a great happening, everybody else looks very different to Leonard, who's there in his Afghan and his pretty shirt and his foreign. And, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people there in suits as well. That's right, yeah. And, you know, it, it was, again, it's, I mean, like we're saying, it's that very small world and that very exciting thing that happened. And these things are amazingly rare, as you well know, Peter. And we kind of so anyway, this this is finally happening at the Fashion and Textile Museum, and we 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 don't exactly know for sure when we're going to have an opening day, but it will probably be next year now. But uh, yeah, it would be very cool to 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 sort of revisit and show you some more things and look at some stuff and. Uh, and Andrew, again, you know, who has an amazing poster collection, has, yeah. has kindly said he would help us out with some of that stuff as well. Because um, with, with regarding this um, exhibition that's happening in London next year, it's um, other than Mark, who's the curator and has the bulk of the clothing, the, the only other person that's um, having clothing within the exhibition is myself. And I'm so, like I've said to you, I'm so honoured to be involved. <laughs> it's very sweet of you to say so, Peter. Yeah, but, you know, I always used to say, you know, when we, we, we used to do various things and you'd go and see people or whatever, you know, and you, you might do some stuff in a business capacity or whatever. And I used to say, well, the thing is, the clothes will speak for themselves. Yeah. Because, you know, and the clothes are about, you've got amazing things, Peter, amazing things absolutely amazing things you know and i'm i'm very 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 pleased to say that you know you're on board you, i was so happy when we uh, contacted each other and you said yeah absolutely i'm up for it well it's like um if even if i wasn't part of it i like i've said to friends that for me like um there was the amazing revolution exhibition a few years ago at dna but and i've been to through the years, some really, really interesting um, 60s related men's fashion exhibitions. But I think this is going to be one of the best private collections of, um, of clothing from that period. Yeah, I'd hope to think so. I mean, I know when we put our original first, you know, Sheila, Nigel and John Pierce <laughs> collection together for Granny, I think that will be the biggest collection of granny of original granny takes a trip pieces that have ever been exhibited in this country. Maybe in the world, you know. I mean, those pieces are very rare, yeah. as you know, Peter. Those they're they're the gold dust, really. Yeah. And yeah. it's you know I I I'm very I I I can't believe we're doing it really. <laughs> Amazing. I can't believe it's finally happening and that. Yeah, it'll be great. And there's, there's so much stuff that is, that has, is coming together. Yeah. Pitch previously never been seen. Um, yeah, amazing things, amazing things. So, um, so basically the, 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 the plan for everyone that's watching this is we will have Mark on again for part two. And in part two, we'll talk more about Mark's collecting and talk more about because hopefully by that time we'll know more, we'll have a date for when, when the exhibition yeah. is going to happen. Yeah. So um, a bit of a tradition I've got now for, for these shows, I, I, there's three quick fire questions. Yeah, go on then, Peter. So the, the first one is, there's the, you, you're given that time machine and you can go and visit one boutique for, or, or designer from the 60s and but purchase from who would it be? I can only have one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it would have to be Granny, wouldn't it? It would yeah. have to be Granny. It would have to be Granny. Yeah. If I could have one piece that I haven't got in my in my collection, 
one one outfit that I haven't got, it would have to be the Mr. Fish Jagger. That's oh, like, yeah. That'd be fabulous. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I I mean when when they did the uh, the exhibitionism uh, stones. Yeah. Exhibition. Even that wasn't there. It wasn't. It was a reconstruction. They That's didn't right. Yeah. Jazz, so. Yeah, the chances are, I think, quite slim. <laughs> but if I could, yeah, I think that's, that, that would be my one actual dream piece. But if I, if I could go to any shop, it would be granny, yeah. So even with the, even you, with you, the you, intimidation. You've, you've, um, you've, just answered, you've just answered my second question. So the first one was, where would it be? And then, and then my second question was going to be, if you could have one piece... And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> there you go. So I, I, right, there's two birds with one stone. So brilliant. And, the last one. And the final, the final question is: Would it, if you had to make a choice between a rare garment or a rare poster, which would it be? Oh, it would be the clothes. Yeah. It would be the clothes. Yeah. I mean, I love them. I love, I love the posters. And it's kind of like you know, because I know you said the same thing with Andrew as well. To me, the music is always, you know, the music's out there. The music yeah. is always, you can always hear it. Yeah. 2,000 light years from home sounds like 2,000 light years from home to me. It doesn't ha I don't have to have that bit of vinyl for me. You know, it's, it, 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 it doesn't have, it's the music that matters yeah. to yeah. hear it. Um, that's, I, I can always get into those sort of things. You know, we love you is still always as good as we love you. Yeah. There is there's something amazingly tactile about <laughs> you know <laughs> and you, that's that's kind of special. Yeah. Even more than the post. I, I again I love the posters. You know, I, it's interesting, you know, one of the things that I was really interested in going back to the game, my A level, is doing those screen prints. The guy who was my art teacher was, was screen print. and I used to do those fades on the on, on the exactly as Nigel did them and bleed them across and not that I knew anything about Hapsash and the colour coat or anything but you know uh, he was teaching me how to do that stuff and yeah I was I, you know so I, I had a, I've got an interest in all that sort of thing and I love it but again you know I don't know there's something so tactile about the clothes yeah. it's just it's so to me it would always be about the clothes now brilliant it would always, brilliant well, Mark, I think I think that's about everything for tonight. Then, I've, cool. I've, it's been absolutely wonderful to get an insight into your whole. Well, it, your passion just screams out of the screen, and I'm sure people can see that the enthusiasm. It, it's very endearing and it's inspiring as well. So, yeah, yeah, like I said, um, I'm not very good at being cool. <laughs> I've always been this enthusiastic, over-the-top person ever since I was a kid, you know. And uh, yeah, it's it's not very good at being cool, but there you go. <laughs> but, but to me, this is better anyway. You know, it, the enthusiasm is just fantastic. Cheers! Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank, thank, and thanks thanks for having me. It's been, yeah, it's, it's been great to share, stuff. It's been a pleasure, and um, I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, take care, Peter. Take care. Bye. Bye.